Good morning. Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is Mae Colcord, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service serves as the launch of our pledge drive led by Patty Watson Swan and Tracy Larson Katz. Music today is led by our inner minister, sorry, music today is led by uh, Dr. Zaneda Robles and our chor choral choir along with Thomas Simpson and our bell choir. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on guidance from our COVID safety team, masks are recommended, though optional, for con congregants inside and are optional outside. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, the narthex, or in our new family lounge in the living room of Neighborhood House where their service is live streamed on a big screen. Today, you are invited for lunch right after service as we celebrate our community of communities and officially launch our pledge drive. Come for food, fellowship, fun activities, and a chance to share how you are inspired, involved, and invested in neighborhood. Next Saturday, March 18th, Neighborhood is hosting a regional meeting of DRUM, Diversity and Re Re Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries, Unitarian Universalism's oldest and largest people of color collective. The gathering is free and includes a shared meal, worship, relationship building, and a program around the stories we tell about people of color in Unitarian Universalism and our imagination of the future of our faith. And finally, the nominating committee is looking to fill four positions on the board this year. Applications are due next Monday, March 20th, and can be found in the newsletter or on our website. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email, posted in the narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
Thank you, Bells. Good morning. It's been such a cold and dreary week. Let's, let's rise as you're willing and able and greet one another. Say good morning. Excellent. Thank you. I know it's hard to stop. We're going to have lunch after so you can continue the conversations. It starts here, in this moment, in this breath, you feel rising in your chest, this beat building between us, the healing, the hunger, the hope, the courage, the calling, the commitment, the drawing out of a new day. It begins now in the imagination, in this story we weave together this story, this song we sing, this prayer we bring into being from our hearts to our lips, from our hands to our hearts. It starts here, our shared life, with praise and thanksgiving, forgiveness and this humbling centering, this promise that we make to keep learning, to keep trying, to keep our sense of humor, to keep close, this knowing that we are all in this together. Come, let us worship together. The opening hymn is number 39 in your gray hymnal or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn number 39, Bring, O Mourn, Thy Music. Oh. 
Good morning. I'm Matt Vasco, Neighborhoods Director of Spiritual Exploration, and I'm here with a story for all ages. This book is called Good People Everywhere. Don't you hate it when the title of the book gives away the ending? <laughs> Spoiler alert, there are good people everywhere. It is by Linnea Gillen and illustrated by Krista Swarner. Today, in neighborhoods all over the world, millions and millions of people are doing very good things. Today, carpenters are building fences and houses and repairing homes that have been damaged by storms. Today, moms and dads are cooking dinners for their families and cooks are working in kitchens, making meals for people who don't have homes. Doctors and midwives are delivering babies and gently passing them into the eager arms of their parents. Teachers are teaching math, spelling, and reading skills Musicians are opening their hearts and playing beautiful music, even right here at Neighborhood, right? And dancers are leaping across dance floors, practicing performances that will bring joy to their friends, their families, and their communities. Today, people are planting seeds, picking fruits and vegetables, and driving them to grocery stores all around the world so you can have a ripe, juicy orange in your lunch. Today, a child is trying her very best to do well on her science test. And a teenage boy is helping a young child who is sad and lonely. Today, a first grade boy is helping a friend who has skinned his knee. And a big sister is holding her baby brother while her mother runs across the street to help a neighbor. Today, millions and millions, and I would dare to say even billions and billions of people are doing very good things. And so will you. I wonder what you will do. Maybe you'll stay for lunch. because it's Pledge Kickoff Sunday, yay! Let's sing our children and youth out to their spiritual exploration classes.
morning. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, the most recent time, besides this morning, that I was on this stage was last November. I was standing cheek to cheek with my partner Greg, singing Lovely Day by Bill Withers at our wedding reception. Rewind back to the previous November of 2021, and you'll see Greg and I visiting this congregation for the first time. It was the period in the pandemic just prior to the Omicron surge where we were tentatively dipping our toes back into the, deep, into the public sphere, and trying to work through the devastating effect that isolation had on our mental health. I was nervous about being anywhere in public, but especially anxious about setting foot in a religious service, which I hadn't done in more than 15 years, except weddings and funerals, and never a UU service. I had braced myself wondering, what's the catch? This sounds too good to be true. I had a lot of grief to shake off, and I still do but now I'm usually able to get the whole way through singing This Little Light of Mine without crying, which I was not able to do at first. Uh, I came to Neighborhood during a time of transition in my life and found you all in transition as well. After feeling utterly let down by the pandemic response from leadership in local and national politics, it was truly refreshing to witness the way that Neighborhood's community was holding itself accountable and working through conflict with mutual respect and open hearts. I feel so grateful to have found this community of communities. In such a short time, I already look around the room and see so many faces that fill me with joy and hope for the world. Thank you to everyone who has welcomed me, to, made me feel home here. Um, I love our shared values that unite us, the freedom to honor our own spiritual truth, and the genuine care that runs at the core of every community here. I found connection and fulfillment for participating in the civic letter writing group, writing as a spiritual practice, the young adults group, <laughs> the newly formed social justice coordination team, our still percolating reproductive justice group, as well as hosting and participating in Dining for Dollars events, just to name a few. Clearly, I like to participate. <laughs> <laughs> the center of your Venn diagram does not need to be as dense as mine is, but I hope that during this pledge season, you'll think about the ways you're already involved at Neighborhood and what it means to you. Is there anything else you've been meaning to try? I hope you'll get around to it this year and strengthen our community. It's an exciting time of growth and change here at Neighborhood, and I look forward to being inspired, involved, and invested with each of you. Thank you. Don't you just love Tracy's sequence? Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here this morning. This is a tough day with the time change. It's always hard for me, but welcome everybody here. So in the spirit of our pledge theme, I wanna talk about why I'm in. A little context here, my first service at Neighborhood Church was back in 1998 in the summer. Greg Stewart was our director of religious education, as it was called then, was presenting along with two youth from senior high. They had just come back from General Assembly, or GA. I was knocked out by how eloquent these high school students were in sharing their enthusiasm of what they experienced. And then last Sunday with Luke, <laughs> and then the other ROP statements I've heard over the years. <laughs> it just reminds me of that, sun that Sunday years ago. Our youth truly inspire me with renewed hope for our future. Having grown up and actively involved in the United Church of Christ in Oakland, I was looking for a church in 1998 that could offer a similar experience for my four-year-old twin daughters. If they could have the positive experience I had had at church, then we were in. My daughters loved coming to preschool program. Peggy Payton was one of their first teachers. And I was drawn to the familiar worship service, the wonderful music, the inspiring sermons, and the focus on social justice. I was going through a divorce at the time of after a long marriage, and I was anxious to establish roots with my daughters in a new place. Neighborhood Church felt like that spiritual home I was looking for, and we joined four months after that Sunday in 1998. My children were fortunate to have an active cohort group from preschool all the way through senior high. We also shared many activities as a family from helping prepare dinner once a month at Union Station, and wonderful memories at Camp de Benville Pines, now a new camp experience I'm sharing with my husband, Bob. As Rachel and Ariel live out of state, they look forward to reconnecting whenever they're in town. 
So our pledge theme this year, as you've heard, I'm in, inspired, involved, invested. Examples for me of being inspired, the understanding I'm gaining from you all to better support my um, lesbian and non-binary children, Reverend Teresa's sermon topics and the music that often makes me cry, it's so beautiful. The honest and tough conversations we've had in discussing the, bo the book Cast, and Reverend Carlton Smith's recent visioning workshop, the energy and momentum that that generated. Involved in the past, I was with a divorce support group. I've been on the board and I was teaching K-1 spirit play. Now more recently, I'm with Helping Hands, helping foster children, supporting them, and the pastoral care committee. I find that working in service of others is spiritually fulfilling for me. As the Dalai Lama has said, we are most joyful when we focus on others, not on ourselves. And finally, invested. I'm invested in the future of this community of communities through my time and financial commitment. For those of you who have already pledged, we truly thank you. We hope you can join us for our luncheon program today. Both today's program materials and materials of our, will be on our pledge table, offer everyone a chance to reflect how this church moves you to be inspired, involved, and invested. Thank you. our co-leaders of our pledge drive, Tracy Larson Katz and Patty Watson Swan. Join me in thanking them for stepping into this world. <laughs> That's the kind of enthusiasm we want. That's terrific. As you know, giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. We are very proud that most Sundays, our congregation dedicates 100% of contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. This is important and meaningful, but these share the plate contributions do not support the operations of the church. So today is a little different. We're launching our pledge drive today and dedicate this portion, the offertory portion of the service to reflecting on our financial pledges. Tracy and Patty have copies of the pledge form, and if you'd like to have a copy, just give them a wave and they'll share it with you. Whether you've made an early pledge and are curious about the materials, if you plan to pledge online, or you don't even know what we're talking about yet, um, let them know and, and they'll be happy to share. As a church, we are vibrant and relevant because of our community. Regardless of minister, in partnership with ministers. It's the community, us together, that sustains and grows across generations. Each year, we ask members to commit your time by participating in spiritual activities, whether Sunday services or any of our many small group ministries, your talent by volunteering, and your treasure by making a financial gift of any size that's meaningful and possible for you. Member pledges make up about half of our church operating budget, and thank goodness we have reliable rental income to cover most of the other half. Our budget covers ministry, music, pastoral care, spiritual exploration, social justice, these beautiful facilities, keeping the lights on and everything going. The pledge portion costs about $150 a month or $1,800 a year per adult. Your choice of what amount you pledge is guided by what's right for you. This year we're aiming overall for a 10% increase to support our new minister and maintain equitable wages. So stop by the pledge table any Sunday in the next month to learn more about these mechanics and the dollars and the details and any questions you have. But for now, let's go back to this idea of giving as a spiritual practice. Let's take a moment for reflection, following Tracy and Patty as our models. Let's take a little moment of silence for each of us to think about how we are, how you are inspired, involved, and invested here at Neighborhood. What are your meaningful connections? 
What does this community mean in your life? As we think of all the ways we're connected, please join me in responding, I'm in, for all of these statements. For all the longtime members who have shared many joys and sorrows here, I'm in. For the parents looking for a values-based intergenerational community for their children, I'm in. For the lifelong you use, new to the area, who look for the comfort of the familiar. I'm in. For the spiritual seekers, looking for support and challenge. I'm in. For everyone who longs for a place to bring their full selves. I'm in. For those who gather here in person, online, in our community of communities, I'm in, and for ourselves, for each other, and for our wild, troubled, and beautiful world. I'm in.
can just end the service now. <laughs> we have been to church. <laughs> Please join me in the spirit of prayer, of meditation, of reflection, as we share in these words from the poet Maya Angelou. We, unaccustomed to courage, exiles from delight, live coiled in shells of loneliness until love leaves its high holy temple and comes into our sight to liberate us into love, into life. Love arrives and in its train come ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet, if we are bold, love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity in the flush of love's light, and we dare to be brave. Suddenly, we see that love costs all that we are and will ever be, and it is only love which sets us free. Amen. Thank you. 
When it comes to Canvas time, I find that churches are always searching for the new gimmick. I've seen churches do recreations of game shows or plays that pretend the church is a public radio station, interrupting each segment of the service to talk about how much it costs. <laughs> Silly songs of every variety. Now, while these may be trying to make a difficult topic fun, they can get tiresome. Makes me think of the old story about Horace Greeley, the publisher and educator of the 19th century. Someone looking for answers about how to raise money for their church approached him and said, we have tried everything, fairs, strawberry festivals, oyster suppers, box socials, mock weddings, grab bags, and lawn fates. Would Mr. Greeley be so good as to suggest some new device to keep the struggling church from disbanding? And Greeley's deadpan response was, try religion. <laughs> and I am grateful to say it feels like our Canvas theme this year really is religious, in the sense that it asks us to contemplate how we can make our commitment to neighborhood manifest, how to make it real. Hence my choice of the word incarnation for this service. Those of you who grew up with traditional religions may have wondered if I was suddenly going to talk about God made flesh. No. But what I want to try to get at is to ask us to think about how we create something together that is greater than the sum of our parts. In the last few years, I've returned often to that quote from the poet and activist Sonia Renee Taylor that became famous at the beginning of the pandemic. She said, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal, other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. We are being asked to stitch a new garment to make manifest our commitment to neighborhood. A lot of statements like this were a little bit optimistic. We haven't yet created something dramatically better or new out of this three-year experience, can you believe, three years, which rocked our foundations. But just because it hasn't fulfilled all of our expectations doesn't mean that we haven't learned some important lessons, however imperfectly. We are assembling the pieces for that new garment. I see that learning really clearly here at Neighborhood in our Unitarian Universalist movement and among progressive religious leaders in general. Even before the pandemic, we were beginning to rethink church, given the reality of declining membership and engagement in traditional churches. One dramatic statistic that made it evident that religious institutions needed to change, in 2018, Americans believed that two institutions were more trustworthy than anything else. Amazon <laughs> and the military. Churches and press were way, way down on the list. For several years now, my colleague Nancy McDonald Ladd has joined with others in ringing the bell for us to pay attention to what clearly needs a new kind of reformation. Recently, she said this, I think that the maintaining of the institution itself and the comfort of the people within it has become too much of the mission so that the congregation can become like a goods and services mechanism of exchange 
If the congregation is sufficiently inspirational, then its members and attendees will reward it with institutional security. If the programs are what people want to receive, then they will pay a professional class of religious people to deliver that product. She says, instead, what I yearn for is a congregational self-understanding that what we do, we do with and for and alongside one another. That the maintaining of the institution is important, yes, but not as important as the way the institution equips us to live in the world. She said, basically, I think it's insufficient for clergy like me to see ourselves as the deliverers of products like inspiration, institutional security, comfort. But even that shift away from a clergy dominant goods and services economy toward a collective reorientation, toward a shared mission that we all live out, requires a real shift of priorities. All of which would be so hard because she says, after all, I'm exactly the person who benefits most from the way things are. I like having a salary. So it might seem odd to quote this in the midst of a campaign where we are asking you to contribute toward a generous salary for a new minister. But I believe that she's getting at something different, something that we have been experimenting with together, a shared partnership in ministry. And I know that's what you are looking for in your new minister. I think she's getting at something deeper here. She's making a claim for helping a congregation become a shared enterprise in which we all feel that we can contribute what we can, as we say, time, talent, and treasure, to create a collective which contributes to the liberation of all. This is not about making this a place where we believe whatever we want to, a bunch of individuals who just happen to be here at the same time. Innovative colleagues like Nancy harken back to the wisdom of one of our greatest theologians of the 20th century, James Luther Adams. She said, Adams framed pro prophetic theology as a dialectic not only, though essentially, between the prophetic and the mystical, but also between the desires of the free individual acting in their own interest and the collective liberatory powers of the whole. When we read Adams today, we find that he tells us something about how we might more honestly relate to the divine, but also something essential about how we are to relate to one another as we seek to be effective agents of the holy in this world. As he once said, by their groups, you shall know them. And isn't that what we've been talking about here at Neighborhood for the last several years, building a dynamic community of communities in which people can bring their whole selves, have their diverse identities valued, and put all in service of the collective liberation of this community and all that surrounds us. To create a community such as this requires that we rethink our values. My mentor, Gil Rindle, recently asked this in a sermon. What will make you and me happier? More money or more forgiveness? What will make you and me more secure? More fences, more laws, or more friendships? What will make you and me more loved by others? More boundaries? between black and white, between red and blue, between gay and straight, or more invitations to everyone. What will give you and me more satisfaction, more possessions, or more purpose? This is the kind of community that we have been trying to rebuild here at Neighborhood Together. When the Canvas team was planning this service, Nick D'Agusto asked me, how has being at Neighborhood transformed you, Reverend Teresa? 
It was a good question. What I have found here among you is a renewed faith in what we do. Over and over again, I meet people here who tell me how much finding this church has meant to you. Some of you have known that feeling for decades, like Patty. Some of you, like Tracy and Greg, are brand new, but all of you testify to how this community has helped you find grounding, has made you feel more whole, just when you needed it the most. When I left the UUA staff over seven years ago, I was burned out and cynical and feeling like we were losing the best of what Unitarian Universalism could be. We were having infighting and resource wars. We're still in dangerous waters, but, it, but what I've seen us do both in this church and the movement as a whole is to embrace the difficult questions of what it means to be a community today a diverse community today, not a collection of like-minded individuals, but a true community in which we understand ourselves as part of something larger than ourselves. My colleague Gretchen Haley says, what our faith asks of us, what our faith imagines for us is that somehow right at this moment, when our hearts break, we will find our way to see through that heartbreak. We will stay put, not close off, not run away, not hurt back, but keep on being in relationship, doing what we can to repair the world and each other. Being here with you as I have these last few years, witnessing your dedication, your hard work in creating and recreating community has helped heal the heart that was beginning to break in me. We are far from perfect at this, but we have begun. In his luminous book, Articulations, Jeff Brown wrote, love can happen in a split second bondedness cannot that's the thing that we learn the hard way that love is not the end of the story it's just the first chapter the next chapters demand that we acknowledge our wounding clear our emotional debris strengthen our capacity for attachment learn how to authentically relate mature in the deep within chapter after chapter of refining our ability to meet love with a true heart. This is the work of a lifetime, our opus of opening. How terrifying and how delightful. This is the kind of incarnation I believe we are becoming. And the best natural metaphor I can find for it is the extraordinary way that starlings fly together. This is called a murmuration. My favorite social change guru, Adrienne Marie Brown, wrote about this metaphor this way. And as you watch the movement, listen to her words. She said, my dream is a movement with such deep trust that we move as a murmuration. The way groups of starlings billow, dive, spin, dance collectively through the air to avoid predators, but also it seems to pass time in the most beautiful way possible. When fish move in this way, they are shoaling. When bees and other insects move in this way, they're swarming. And I love all the words for this activity. Here's how it works. In the murmuration shoal swarm, each creature is tuned into its neighbors, the creatures right around it in the formation. There's a right relationship, a right distance between them. Too close and they crash, too far away and they can't feel the micro adaptations of other bodies. Each creature shifts direction, speed and proximity based on the other bodies. There is a deep trust in this. 
to lift because the birds around you are lifting, to live based on your collective real-time adaptations. In this way, thousands of birds can move together, each empowered with basic rules and a vision to live. Imagine our movements cultivating this type of trust and depth with each other having strategic flocking in our playbooks. Adaptation reduces exhaustion. No one bears the burden alone of figuring out the next move and muscling towards it. There is efficiency at play. Is something not working? Stop, change. If something is working, keep doing it, learning and innovating as you go. This is the kind of garment we have been stitching together at Neighborhood. This is the kind of incarnation we hope to be and that we may learn to be and to become. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 1028 in your teal hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing hymn 1028, The Fire of Commitment. that you are given the same things that have sustained the world through complicated days. Use all of them. Wonder, courage, awe, interdependence, the need to rest and the need to move. Compromise on the inflection, but not the substance. Consider your role and the role of the grass and the tree swallow that comes singing today. Just do the part that you cannot leave undone. Amen.
This is open to everybody. Visitors are welcome, please. We warmly encourage you to stay for a delicious lunch together on the labyrinth. If you're ready to turn in your pledge, please drop it at the pledge table just outside or bring it to the lunch with you and we'll collect it there. If you have any questions, there are many of us you can talk with. Over lunch, we'll explore together how we each are inspired, involved, and invested at neighborhood. As you leave the sanctuary, you will receive a question to get your wheels turning and possibly for sharing ideas with others in line at lunch or at your table. So see you at the labyrinth.